Your name, please? William Easter. Mr. William Easter? Right. Your passport, please. Do I have to go through this rigmarole every time? Regulation, sir. Beastly nuisance, I call it. Receive your American visa in Lisbon. Will there be time? Definitely. We seem to have cut our time pretty close, Sir Henry. Ah. Have you a word, Sir Henry? Do you wish to make any comments, press, sir? Yes, sir Henry, uh, what is your destination, New York or Washington? I'm sorry, I have nothing to say. Sir Henry Marchmont, official business. Oh, Sir Henry Marchmont. Sir Henry, go. Good luck, Sir Henry. Thanks, I may need it. Shall I take your case, sir? Definitely not. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 I see. You think the old boy carried the fate of the Empire in that little black case? Perhaps he does. Time's up, boys. Roll it away. Lively now. Hey, just a moment, you shy one passenger. Hold on. Wait a bit. Wait, I say. I've got passage. Uh, yes, all right. Your name, sir? Uh, uh, Grayson's the name. Uh, John Grayson, senior clerk, Paolo Nash and Paolo, solicitors, Chancery Lane. Uh, you've got it all there. Uh, everything quite regular. Uh, sorry to delay you. Uh, Mr. Bus had to take a taxi. Fearful nuisance. Yes, sir. Hop aboard. Will you be late uh, now? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks awfully. Sorry to delay. Thanks awfully. Right, oh, boys. Follow the way. Excuse me, sir. Awfully sorry. Quite all right. Uh, no sense of balance. None whatever. Thanks. Clumsy of me. No sense of balance. That's what it is. Effect of the inner ear, I fancy. that you were en route to Washington, Sir Henry. I just couldn't rest until I found you. Now, do you know, when can you dine with us? Very kind, Mrs. Jefferson. I'll put you first on my unofficial list. Oh, I have a much better idea. Oh. You must let me put you up during your stay. Thanks very Washington much, but... is so crowded. I'll put you in the blue room. Come in. isn't the one who is. I don't know. But the head received a cable from London tipping him off. It's up to us to find the real British agent before this train reaches Washington. Yeah. Whoever's got the document will be protected there. If Sir Henry isn't carrying it. I've got it. Besides Sir Henry and myself, only one man has come all the way from London. A chap called Grayson. John Grayson. Well, then Grayson's our man. Grayson's carrying the document, while Sir Henry's being used as a decoy. <laughs> it's so old, it's new. When Grayson leaves the cloud car and goes to get his luggage, that's our cue. 
We know what to do, Easter. Good. That's Grayson standing at the bar. The little fellow. Excuse me, sir. Don't give it a thought, brother. I'm in politics. I'm used to hard knocks. I'm Henry Babcock, son of the Babcock. How do you do? John Grayson. Sit down, Grayson. Have a glass of grape juice from my home state. Used to know a man named Grayson. Mighty fine man. He was murdered. Uh, two grapes, George. From the fire, sir. This book has got me all confused. I do wish you'd set me straight on the international situation. Rather large order, I'm afraid. Oh, you're so right, Sir Henry. We must take the broader view, I always say. <laughs> Now, they're great juice, Grayson. You can't have too many vitamins, I always say. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. But if you don't mind, uh, I, I, I'll have a whiskey and soda. Why, sure. George, bring them over, will you? Uh, yes. Let's get a chair. I was built for comfort. <laughs> Jolly little beggars, what? Kept some myself as a lad. Till mother got a cat. Shh. Don't say Z A D. Oh, sorry. Permit me, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Very kind, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, pardon me, sir. Here we are. <clears throat> Porter. Yes, sir. Are we on time? Yes, sir. Be in Washington in 20 minutes. By the way, Grayson, what's your line? Line? Yeah, what business are you in? What's your racket? Oh, uh, I represent a London legal firm, Parlo, Nash and Parlo. Parlo? I used to know a man named Parlo. No, no, it was Marlowe. Couldn't have been the same fellow. No, oh, I suppose not. I've been making the tour of my state, getting the opinions of the home folks, taking a lot of their ideas back to Washington. I'd like to hear more of your activities, Senator. Give me your address, sir, and I'll have all my speeches mailed to you. You're quite too kind, sir. Sorry I have no card. <coughs> oh, Porter. Yes, miss? Permit me. Thank you very much. Not at all. I'll be at this address for the next week or so. I hope. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll get my papers together. Pleasant meeting, my friend. Better look me up in Washington. I'll just get my bag. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to pay George. Excuse me, sir. Well, what's the matter? Listen to the blackout. Keep your seat. Nancy, darling. I didn't dream you'd be able Good to meet boy, me. George. I got leave. Oh, darling, that's wonderful. Just three days. Oh, that's awful. We haven't a second to lose. First thing I did. As I was saying, sir. Henry. Was get this. Oh, really? This finger. Well, I haven't had much experience. <laughs> Look, the day after tomorrow, your aunt's giving us reception. Until then, you and I are going to be a couple of busy people. Oh, I beg your pardon. Goodbye. Who's your boyfriend? You needn't worry. He just lit a cigarette for me.
BBC News Bureau, broadcasting from London. At this time, we present our regular morning summary of the news. A British subject has disappeared under curious circumstances. John Grayson, senior clerk in the firm of Parlow, Nash and Parlow, solicitors, Chancery Lane, has not arrived at his firm's representatives in Washington. Foul play is suspected. Deplorable, simply deplorable. It's the sort of thing that shakes your faith, by George. I say, Holmes, shakes your faith in everything. You alarm me, Watson. I've never seen you affected by the news, however startling. Startling, my dear fellow, it's devastating. Seen the scores? The Navy got 428 for six wickets against the Army at Lords. May I draw your attention to the fact that really momentous things are happening in the world today? Oh, I know all about that. I'll get to them later on. Excuse me. Mind my egg, Obi. Oh, I'm sorry. With your consuming interest in the game, I'm surprised that you've changed your mind about running up to Lord's Cricket Ground this afternoon. Well, can't be helped. I had to put it off. How did you know I changed my mind? Elementary, my dear Watson. Invariably, when you go to a cricket match, you fill your flask with my best whiskey. Just now, I noted in passing that the flask was empty. The single whiff informed me that it had been recently filled. Obviously, after filling it, you would pour the contents back into the bottle. Therefore, you had changed your mind about a cricket match. You amaze me, Holmes. You positively amaze me. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes. There's a gentleman, and he's very insistent. Well, I do declare he followed me right up the stairs. Didn't I ask you to wait? My good woman, you may ask me to wait, but not the British Empire. Mr. Holmes, I must talk to you immediately. How are you, Mr. Allens? That will be all now, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. My good woman, indeed. Huh. Allens? I see if you know that name. Don't tell me, my dear Watson, that you don't recognize Mr. Allen at the Home Office. Oh, yes, of course. I knew you the moment you came in. How are you, Allen? How do you do? Do you see what the Navy did to the Army at Lord's yesterday? All right, yes, Watson, yes, go yes. on with the breakfast. Bad show. 428, six wicket. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I'm here on a matter of the utmost secrecy. Now, I assure you, Mr. Allen, that Dr. Watson is the very soul of discretion. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Brother by Watson, please be so good as to keep tapping on the table with your knife. Tell me, I won't tell you, It will break the wavelengths if by any chance there's a dictograph in the walls. Oh, really? Cigarette? No, thank you. You can stop now, Watson. Well, Mr. Allens, I take it you've called on me in connection with the kidnapping of John Grayson in America last night. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Grayson was carrying a document of a very confidential nature. Indeed. Its contents are of such great international importance that I am not at liberty to reveal them. But if that document falls into the hands of the enemy, I can only say it will be absolutely disastrous for this government and our allies. For that reason, we did not wish to transport it to Washington in the usual way. So a regular king's messenger, Sir Henry Marchmont, was dispatched. Not carrying the document, of course. That's right. Sir Henry was a sort of... Uh, sort of a red herring, shall we say? Precisely. Mm -hmm. The document was actually entrusted to a reliable but insignificant man in our secret service. On his arrival in Washington, he was to make himself known to Sir Henry and deliver the document. Now, not even Sir Henry knew that this man, Pettibone, who traveled under the name of John Grayson, was the real messenger. Pettibone? Yes. Alfred Pettibone? Yes. Good man. None better. I've worked with him often. I hope you may be able to work with him again. But he's completely disappeared. He's vanished, gone, without leaving a trace. I can see the possibility of serious ramifications in his disappearance. Exactly. So far, we've been able to keep the knowledge of our loss from both the American and British public. Holmes, you must retrieve that document before it can be used against us. Of course, the uh, Washington police have been notified of Grayson's disappearance, but even they don't know that he was carrying the document. Now, that's about all the detail I'm at liberty to give you. Well, if they've got Grayson, that is Pettibone, they must have got the papers. Not necessarily, Watson. It doesn't follow because they've got the man, they've got the document. What form was this document in? It was typed on two sheets of legal paper. Two sheets? That's too bulky to swallow. And dry, Watson. Fearfully dry. Huh? Especially legal papers. Well, whatever shape the document was in, I trust Pettibone to get rid of it before anyone could lay hands on him. The document must be found before it falls into the hands of our enemies. I'm here on behalf of His Majesty's government to urge you to find it. 
That means going to Washington, of course. With all possible speed. A bomber is waiting for you at Crichton. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Adams. Goodbye, Holmes. Good luck. Thanks very much. We're relying on you. Well, Watson, we're off to Washington at once. America? I say, that's exciting. I've never seen a game of baseball. Let's go and start packing it, wasn't it? First, I'd like to take a look at the home of Alfred Pettibone. Come on, Watson. Why, Dr. Watson, what a surprise. And Mr. Holmes, won't you come in? Thank you. I'm frightfully sorry, but you won't find my son in. He's gone to Washington, some business or other. Poor fellow, I'm afraid that he'll never, never get used to the climate over there. Oh. Would you mind if we looked over your son's room? Why, of course. It's upstairs. Thank you. Some friends tell me it's very, very muggy, very sticky. So I had a letter from Philadelphia the other day. I find his room in a dreadful pickle, Mr. Holmes. Quite ripped he is, if I as much as put my nose inside, as if I cared anything about his silly old collection. This sort of pettibone seems a curious sort of fellow. Sort of collector of collections. Posted stamps. Military buttons. Butterfly. Oh. Bugs, snapshots, <laughs> all sorts of rubbish. Yes, I shall write a monograph someday on the noxious habit of accumulating useless trivia. Please be so good as to stop pacing, Watson. You distract me. All right, all right. I'm greatly mistaken. Our friend Pettibone did not carry two pages of legal paper when he left this room. I wouldn't be too sure, Holmes. Ashes are deceptive, you know. On the contrary, my dear Watson. The rag used in artificial documents leaves an ash that is unmistakable. Oh, do stop pacing. I'm not pacing. I've moved an inch. I'm sorry, old fellow. My error. Must be Mrs. Pettibone. Every woman light on her feet. Doesn't follow. Our friend seems to be quite a camera enthusiast. What's this? Cook F15. That's a very fast lens. F35. Summer. Copying setup. American match folders. That's right. USA. Now, why would Pettibone want American match folders in his work? And a microscope. Most interesting. How was this? Watson, this microscope was last used for examining microfilm. I'm beginning to see the pattern. Stop now. Did you know that the letters of our soldiers overseas are being photographed on microfilm so that one carrier pigeon can carry the equivalent of 18,000 letters? Oh, really? We had a carrier pigeon in the last war. Back in 1915, belonging to the Brigade Signal Corps. Did you? Yeah, the poor bird kept flying. Round and round in circles all day long. Found out later on that it was cross-eyed. Tragic thing. Mm. Huh? First we took where are you going? Huh? Oh, dark room, huh? This is what I was looking for. Huh? This projector magnifies tremendously anything placed on the slide. Like this piece of microfilm. Understand? I can't say I do exactly now. Wait a minute. I'll show you what he's photographed. Oh, it's a match folder. What do you want to photograph that for? Probably to line up his equipment before he photographed the document. We've got it, Watson. Look over? Yes. Come along. Oh, it's all as clear as mud to me. <laughs> Just as I thought. This document has been reduced to microfilm to make its concealment possible. Alfred Pettibone is a most ingenious fellow. 
A bulky document is obviously difficult to conceal. But two pages of a state paper, photographed on microfilm, would be reduced to a size no larger than a halfpenny stamp. Slitting a match folder with this, uh, with this razor blade, Pettibone placed the now minute document inside, stuck it together again, and there he had it. An American match folder, rare in London, but completely inconspicuous in the United States. Do you mean to say we're off to America just to look for a match folder? <laughs> it's a big country. A big country, Watson. And a small match folder. Come along. Did you find what you were looking for, Mr. Holmes? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Pettibone. Mother by, you haven't been up on the roof in the last 20 minutes, have you? Why, no. What made you think... Well, we I... distinctly heard footsteps... Nonsense, Watson. It was the house settling. Gracious, yes. Such popping and groaning. We're quite used to it. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Goodbye, Mrs. Pettibone. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. Goodbye. So sorry you missed Alfred. I'll tell him the minute he gets back. Gets back? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Well, goodbye again, Mrs. Pettibone. Goodbye. Just a minute, Watson. There's no accident, I assure you, Watson. Well, aren't you going to find out who did it? Time's too precious now. But at least I know they've learned of my entry into the case. They? Who are they? The same group that took Alfred Pettibone off the train on his way to Washington. A group that will stop at nothing to get their hands on the document he carried. Their leader is a clever, resourceful criminal who seems to have sources of information from everywhere. Oh, that means a worldwide organization who will stop at nothing, you say? Quite. That's why we must get our bags and ourselves aboard that bomber without delay. We're opposed by an adversary worthy of our best efforts. At present, he has all the advantages. Even that of being only a merciless, nameless shadow. Think of it, Watson. In a few hours, we'll be flying out over the Atlantic. We're flying over New York, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. We've been cleared by radio. Non-stop Washington. What is that book that so engrosses your attention, Watson? A book on the quaint customs and manners of America. We must be halfway across, and I've only got to page 37. For your information, my dear fellow, we are now flying over New York. Flying over New York? Gracious me. It's a tall thing. You're being very helpful, Mr. Lang. Detective Lieutenant Grogan of the Washington Police. How do you do? Welcome to Washington. Thank you. This is my associate, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How are you? I suppose I should say, how are you, buddy? Uh, what's, uh, what's cooking? Oh, come along, Watson. <laughs> oh, it says it's in the book. Uh, what's cooking? Grogan had charge of investigating the Grayson case for the Washington police. Any new developments, Grogan? None, Mr. Holmes. We'd be glad to let you have our complete file. And, of course, we'll cooperate in every way. Thank you. I shall appreciate your help. Especially as I'm unfamiliar with your country. Oh, yes, of course. This is your first visit. Oh, there's the Lincoln Memorial. Most impressive. Oh, by the by, Mr. Lang, thank you for your cablegram. I received it just before I left London. Cable? I sent no cable. About our reservations at the Hotel Metropole. Why, no. We thought you'd stay at the Embassy, of course. Look at that. Well, since some strange person has taken such an extraordinary interest in my welfare, I think I shall stay at the Hotel Metropole. Oh, Mr. Holmes, there's the Washington Monument. There's the Capitol, Mr. Holmes.
magnificent. We're expecting you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. I questioned everybody known to have been in that club car, as a matter of course. So Henry Marchmont confirms that Grayson had contact only with the people on this list. Now, he had a drink with Senator Babcock. And he chatted with a Miss Pringle about some mice she had in the cage. And he picked up a book dropped by uh, Mrs. Jellison. Not very much to go on. How many of these people have been attacked already? I've heard about your deductions, Mr. Holmes. Well, Senator Babcock was held up on his way from the station, with nothing taken. And Mrs. Jellison's home was ransacked that night. And she found the book that she carried from the train literally torn to bits. That's right. Miss Pringle? Well, Miss Pringle says someone released the mice from the cage that during the night sometime, and she found the cage torn apart. What happened to the mice, I wonder? An intriguing line of thought, Watson, but not essential to the case. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Grogan, they're still looking for the document. I'd very much like to have a look at that club car. Well, that'll be easy. I have the car held on a siding in the railroad yard. Good. But we've searched the car thoroughly, Mr. Holmes. We couldn't find a thing. Well... What are you doing? What's this? Mr. Holmes, your trunk. Trunk? I have no trunk. It says right there. To Sherlock Holmes, Hotel Metropole. How was this trunk delivered? An expressman brought it, sir. What's the name of the company? Do you remember the license number? Naturally, I didn't notice that. I just signed for it. All right, thank you. That'll do. Well, the trunk's not locked. Great Scott. Poor chap. You recognize him, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Who was he? The man we're looking for, John Grayson. His real name is Alfred Pettibone. British Secret Service. Why should they send the body here? Obviously to frighten us. Or to tell us they know that Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Gentlemen, they knew we were on the case as early as their attempt on our lives in London. They're much too intelligent to believe that a corpse would frighten a trained detective. No, I rather think they intend this as a message. And they wanted to be sure that I'd be here at the Hotel Metropole to receive it. Message? What do you mean? They want us to believe that they found the document. And therefore have no further use for Grayson. Well, if that's true, then we're done for. I'm not so sure that it is true, Watson. If they have the document, why are they wasting time sending me this? No, it's an attempt to throw me off the track. Grogan, you have a police laboratory, of course. Certainly. I'll see what I can find out about the body. Yes, whatever marks it reveals. And the trunk. A microscopic examination. Everything about it. The lining, the blanket in which the body is wrapped, everything. Let nothing escape. We have the best police laboratories in the world, Mr. Holmes. I beg your pardon, Lieutenant Grogan. Oh. You see, I'm so accustomed to working quite alone at my lodgings in Baker Street that I sometimes forget the more modern scientific methods so particularly effective here in America. Well, if there's anything there, they'll find it, Mr. Holmes. While you're doing that, I'll take a look at the club car. Coming, Watson? Here we are, Mr. Holmes. I have the porter, as you asked, and the railroad company sent Mr. Moore to unlock for us. Delighted. How do you do? Very good. Let's go in. This way, gentlemen. Well. It looks as if the police have made a thorough search. Whoever did it, it wasn't the police. There have been visitors here since our friend Grogan. My goodness, look at our car. Talk about a blitz. I say, Holmes, if Grayson hid anything in this car, it certainly isn't here now. Not necessarily, Watson. If you'll help me put this place in uh, some kind of order. Yes, sir, boss. This would go about here, I imagine. Yeah, that's it, boss. Yes, and, yes. uh, wait a minute. Oh, that right? Yeah, that's certainly more like it. Yes, sir. Thank you. That'll be all. Watson, will you be uh, Mr. Grayson for the moment? Grayson? Huh, if you want me to, old man. What do you want me to do? You're having a drink at the bar. Oh, drink at the bar. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> drink at the bar. Uh, Bring me a whiskey and soda, will you, Stuart? Stuart? <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Watson, but the bar's closed. Well, it says the bar's closed. According to Grogan's reconstruction of the scene, let me see. Uh... Yes. Grayson pauses at the bar while Senator Babcock moves across and sits down here. Do you mind being Senator Babcock for the moment, Watson? Oh, 
going up in the world. <laughs> Sit down, please. Now, uh, Miss Pringle is seated there. Over there, Watson. Hmm? Now, now I'm Miss Pringle. That's right, the mouse woman. Oh, the mouse woman. Uh, Watson, over here, please. Oh. No, not there, not there. That's Senator Babcock. Oh, pardon me, Senator. Sit down, please. Now you're Mrs. Jellison. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes. He ain't Mrs. Jellison. He's the young lady. What? Sir Henry Marchmont was sitting right here, and Mrs. Jellison was right here. She's a sort of a big, fat lady. What did Grayson do that attracted your attention so particularly to Mrs. Jellison? The little man, he retrieved her book. And the young lady sitting here, didn't she converse with the little man? No, sir. That young lady didn't have no converse with no one. When the little man lit a cigarette, she ran back and said, thank you very much. But you have matches here for your customers. Oh, yes, she called me and I saw a cigarette and I knew she wanted a match. And Grayson used one of his own matches? Dog it up. Oh, yes, he took a folder from his coat pocket. Did he put the match folder back in his pocket, or did he give it to the young lady? I don't remember. I was fairly busy. Try to remember. Well, if I should try to doomsday, I couldn't rightly say just what happened to that match folder. Oh, yes. I remember just one important thing. What? When a little man lit her cigarette, he said something very peculiar. What was it? He said, permit me. Oh. <clears throat> well, all right, gentlemen, I'm extremely grateful to all of you. That's all we can do for the present, I think. Since the place was torn to bits after the murder of Grayson, the attacks on Senator Babcock, Mrs. Jellison, and Miss Pringle, I'm convinced that the document left the club car long before these events. But how? By whom? And who was the mysterious young lady whose cigarette Grayson lighted? Did anyone meet the young lady? He sure did. He? Who was he? Tall, handsome, in a uniform. I see. I suppose you wouldn't remember what kind of a uniform. I certainly would. Lieutenant. Navy flyer. My boy's in the army. He's gonna be a flyer, too. Splendid. Did you happen to hear them say anything? Oh, I didn't happen. I just couldn't help hearing it. Mm -hmm. Well, what did they say? Oh, yes. He said he had three-day leave. He had to move fast before the big part of her aunt was given him. Then, too, he put a ring on her finger and they both looked mighty happy. Mm -hmm. Just the way you look right now. And the way I'm looking myself. Come on, Watson. That's the girl. I told the head I could swear to it. Is the address there? All there. Right in her laps. And also right in the lap of Sherlock Holmes. That's the least of our worries. The head could handle ten like Holmes. I hope so. <laughs> but don't underrate that Englishman. I have several friends who did. They now grace some of the best prisons in England. Yes, sir? I talked to the catering company. It's quite all right. They could hardly refuse me. It's the Acton Company. The Acton Catering Company. Yes, sir. I know what to do. Hop over there. You're going to work for the catering company. Right. When you get in the house, find out all you can. Katie. Yes? You ought to go as a guest. Will it be safe? It'll have to be. I'll try and get in the girls' room. Unless you hear from me, carry on as we planned. Oh. Flash Gordon. Oh. Seems a very capable fellow. Oh. Sports pages. Hmm? These Brooklyn fellows seem to be arguing with the umpire. Story thing. What are you eating, Watson? Gum? Oh. Put it away. Hmm? Oh, never seen you take an interest in the society columns before. It's a concern I'll drop at once, I assure you, Watson. Hmm? You found what you're looking for? Oh, how do you know this is the girl? It would be an extraordinary coincidence, wouldn't it? If more than one naval lieutenant in Washington were to become engaged in the last few days to a girl from New York whose aunt was giving them a reception? By Joe, you must be right. She's, she's a pretty girl. <laughs> yes. 
He's walking around with a dynamite in a handbag. <laughs> Wardlaw Place. Who is it? Me, Pete. You can't come up here. I did, though. One get you two. Mm. The party's gonna be awfully dull after this. Let's not go. Let's go away and get married. You've only got one more day. That's an idea. No, we can't do that to Andy. I'll tell you. Let's sneak a look at the new apartment. Mm. It was awful sweet of Andy to give us the whole floor of this house for our apartment. The least we can do is let her have the fun of showing it to us. Okay. Let's face the party. I'll get my bag. You? Oh, no, you don't. That's the way I got them. Is your name Muxton? Of course, I know it as well as my own. And this is Mrs. Vale. How, How do you do? do? <laughs> Isn't it quite? Oh, of course. <laughs> Any luck? Not yet. That must be Lieutenant Merriam with Miss Partridge over there. Certainly glad to hear the news, Pete. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Major. Thank you. You're a lucky guy, Pete. I'll see you later. Third floor, first door. I'll wait there. You bring him up. Thank you, sir. A toast to the happy couple. A toast. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Happy landing. Hey, may I well know, certainly. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lieutenant Merriam, hmm? telephone, sir. Navy Department calling. Oh, yes. Be right back. Lead on, McDuff. This way, sir. Mm. Matches. Match me, darling. <laughs> Pick them up. Thank you. Oh, Pete, hold it. You can keep them, Major. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Not for me, thank you. No, thank you. Why up here? They said it was private. There's a phone in here, sir. Hey, it's my new apartment. Miss Parchers didn't want me to see it till after it was finished. Here you are, sir. Quite a smell of paint, sir. In here, sir. Thank you. You should get some action, Sir Henry, with Sherlock Holmes in Washington. Yes. I don't mind telling you I'd give anything to get my hands on that document. Yes, I know. Or at least know that it's in safe hands. Thanks. Engaged today and married tomorrow. No, thanks. 
give you a match. Miss Partridge? Ma yes? Lieutenant Merriam asked if you would come to the new apartment. But he's not supposed to see it yet. The new apartment? He must think you're already married. Yes, I don't dare let that man out of my sight. Excuse me, will you please? Surely. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, may I? Thank you. This way, please. Oh, I know the way, thank you. Here we are, Grogan. Uh, good connections. We'd better go into the party. Well, I think you'd better go in first, Mr. Holmes. I'm not very good at this sort of thing. I think you do all right. <laughs> the only possible explanation. Uh, Mrs. Partridge, uh, forgive my intruding, but is your niece the kind of girl who would just disappear in this manner of her own free will? Well, ordinarily, of course not. But the girl's in love. In love? Well, of course, if they're in love, that's... <laughs> Even so, they'd naturally tell you of their destination. Really, I've no idea. Oh, but they'll be back here again tomorrow. You see, I prepared an apartment for them, an entire floor in this house. Uh, by the by, Mrs. Partridge, I gather the rug you ordered for the apartment was not entirely satisfactory. Oh, those tiresome workmen. I told them not to come in here this afternoon, but they did. And walked out with a rug which they no doubt informed you had been sent by mistake and would be replaced tomorrow. Yes, but however did you Quick, know that? show me the apartment. Yes, there were two rugs there. One for the living room and one for the dining room. Oh, your workmen wear rubber sole shoes, do they not? Oh, but yes, always. Their company requires them to. Nevertheless, there have been leather heels on this floor. And a woman's heels. Very recently, I should say. And not yours, Mrs. Partridge. But recently enough, so that no dust has had time to settle in the imprints. <laughs> Stay over there, please. There seems to be a struggle over there. A woman's footprints disappear and a man's leather heels come round and stop there. Either she was carried out in the carpet, or else... Where does that door lead to? Why, it's a dressing room. Perhaps an ordinary skeleton key. Let's try it. Watson, this is a matter for you, I'm afraid. Excuse me. Who is he? Is it Miriam? Peter! Take it easy, Mrs. Partridge. Let the doctor examine him. How is he, Watson? Nasty crack on the head. Nothing serious, thank heavens. Is there somewhere where you can lie down? Of course. Poor Peter. Take him to my room. Yes, yeah, sir. Put your, put your arm on my neck. That's the old chair. Mr. That's Holmes, it. you must find Nancy. Quite. Yes. Poor Peter. That girl disappeared right from under our noses. It's unbelievable. I better try to trace that truck. That won't lead us anywhere. Our antagonist is too clever for that. But the girl must be found immediately. You're sure the police chemists found nothing definite in their examination of the trunk? Not one thing pertinent to the case. What about Grayson's body and the blanket it was wrapped in? Nothing. Every object connected with this case has some kind of story to tell. Uh, do you think they'd mind if... Uh... The laboratory is completely at your disposal, Mr. Uh, thank you. Dr. Watson and I will go there at once. The usual findings on the trunk, Mr. Holmes. Bought in Washington, been banged about a good deal. All labels removed. Mm. And the body? No marks of any kind. Very well. If you need me, call. Thank you. Watson, please. Just tidying up a bit. This blanket is beginning to tell me many things. Oh, really? I don't say so. It only remains to translate them properly. Yes. And just as I thought, this blanket has had a most varied history. It's been on many a sea voyage. The latest, not six months ago. Since then, it has been used to wrap a multiplicity of objects. 
Carvings of teak wood. Candle snuffers made of pewter. And furniture. Furniture? Yes. Teak wood leaves an unmistakable stain. Pewter rubs off easily. And there are evidences of wax drippings. But what particularly concerns us, Watson, is the furniture. Most likely a chair. Louis the Fifteenth, in yellow and maroon satin. What do all these things suggest to you, Watson? Well, let me see. An aunt of mine, Matilda, lives in Brighton. Very old-fashioned, very aged. Exactly. Antiques. We've a lot of ground to cover before nightfall. Ground? What ground? If necessary, all the antique shops in Washington. A, A, N, T, I. There we are, antiques. Antiques? What connection is a Louis the Fifteenth chair with this partridge girl? This sliver of wood came from a Louis the Fifteenth chair that had once been wrapped in that blanket. From other evidences the blanket supplies, I deduce that it's been used in an antique shop. And whoever controls those antiques murdered Grayson and kidnapped the girl. What? That's it, Watson. Come along. Before the girl's kidnapper becomes her murderer. Shopping for antiques. You must keep searching, Watson. The girl's in grave danger. Hello. Hello. Oh, sir. What is it, huh? This isn't the place it seems to be. Look, Watson. Those cabinets. Obviously imitation, and yet they're priced as if they were authentic. Ah, uh, beware. And all that, eh, Holmes? <laughs> Watson, I feel certain this is it. This is my purse. May I? Thank you. What kind of a joke is this? Oh, don't bother to answer. You can tell the police all about it. And you shall, I promise you. But there are no police here. Haven't you noticed? We are quite alone. I sent for you to ask you a few questions. You always sent a rug for your guests. It was a very nice rug, Miss Partridge. It's not my idea of a method of transportation. No, I'm sorry about that, but I'm afraid it was unavoidable. But why? You've no right to bring me here like this. I've always found it wise to take what rights I can get. Miss Partridge, you have a document which I must have. Document? I have no document. It won't do you any good to deny it. But I do deny it. I don't know what you're talking about. You remain a prisoner until you produce it. How can I produce it when I haven't got it? But you have. It was observed that on the train you had contact with a little British agent named Grayson. He gave you something. Where is it? But I hardly even noticed the man. I... I wouldn't even have remembered him if I hadn't seen his picture in the paper. He disappeared or something. He's dead, Miss Partridge. Oh. Now will you tell me what I want to know? But I can't. You won't? I can't, I tell you. Let me out of here. He gave me nothing. That's strange, because I know he spoke to you. There's something very curious about that door up there. To open it, you'd have to know the combination. But I tell you, I spoke to no one on that train. Well, didn't the little man try to be attentive to you? Oh, he, he may have offered the usual courtesies. I don't even remember. I see. I'm sorry. Aren't you spoke one of the years? Thank you. And you're quite sure he said nothing at all to you? Of course I'm sure. Permit me. And you're certain that nothing passed between you? I'm certain. Mr. Howe, please. I must ask you to trust me with your bag a little longer. I have an eccentric interest in the linings of purses. It's a foible. Ah, you know Mr. Howe, I believe. 
Mr. Howe is a gentleman of unusual accomplishments. Under his influence, I've known people talk fluently who never talked before. But I don't know anything, I tell you, nothing. Nothing, I swear on it. I don't know anything. <laughs> You stay out here. I'll go inside. I'll assume the character of an eccentric art collector. As soon as I'm convinced that this is the place we're looking for, I'll signal to you. And you get Grogan and bring him here on a run. But don't lose any time. An extra second may cost a life. No, madam, I don't know who she is. But uh, notice the modeling. It has good symmetry, good lines. Oh, uh, I'll be right with you, sir. No, thank you. I'll just take a look around. What an extraordinary cabinet. Spanish. Moorish influence. Imitation, of course. It is not an imitation. It's authentic. Oh, come now, my dear man. Ah. May I see some of these ceramics? Those aren't for sale. They're Ming vases, mostly, and they haven't been marked yet. Well, that's really a very little consequence. You see, if they're genuine, I can tell to within a shilling what the international price might be. If you please, sir, there are other customers. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Well, I'll just look around. Ah, what a very interesting collection of pewter. That will be $500. Now, would you just give me the address where you want it sent? Yes, Mrs. J. Wellington, Jr. DuPont Circle. Send out in the morning. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm most terribly sorry. You've broken one of our best pieces, sir. Ming Dynasty. A, a Tang Dynasty. Not Ming. Definitely not Ming. It is my business to know, sir. The pottery is Ming and worth $2,300. As we're closing for the evening, I must ask you to settle at once. Oh, nonsense, my good man. Tang pottery is worth $600 at best. Just a moment, please. Yes, of course. Hello? What's going on up there? A customer dropped a valuable piece of pottery. I'll finish with him immediately. How can you say that it's Ming? 2,300 fiddlesticks. You ask $2,300 for something that's worth no more than 600. I demand to see the proprietor. Now, wait There are minute, bureaus please. for the protection of innocent customers. Show me to the owner of this establishment, or I'll turn the entire affair over to my legal representative. Ming, indeed. Just a minute. What tenery, what skullduggery. I mean to put an end to it this very night. Ming, for Tang, indeed. And I won't be put off. Call the proprietor immediately. Very well. Just a minute. Yes? This man's mad. An eccentric collector. I can't get rid of him. He insists on seeing you in person. All right, stall him for half a minute, then send him into my office. I'll get rid of him and quickly. Oh, how? No screams till the customer's gone.
You get downstairs. Yes, sir. I'm most frightfully sorry. I'm most frightfully sorry about the vows, but, uh, but really, sir, your clerk is guilty of attempting the most obvious fraud. You see, uh, he tried to convince me that I'd broken a Ming pottery when anyone could see that it belonged to the Tang era. Uh, its, its value is no more than six hundred dollars. All right, you pay him the six hundred. We'll call the matter settled. Oh. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I'll send you my check in the morning. I. Uh, I see you know the uh, London value of these pieces. It's my business. Exactly. Yes, exactly. You know, I think you're just the man to help me find some furniture I'm anxious to get. I'm most frightfully bored with the usual conglomeration of pieces that we can pick up on the other side. What do you really want, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Herr yeah, Heinrich Henkel. Or as you now call yourself, Mr. Richard Stanley. In 1914, secret agent of the German Kaiser. Since then, head of the most insidious international spy ring that ever existed. You're wrong. A case of mistaken identity. I've been a respected member of this community for a great many years. I deal in antiques because of their rarity and beauty. Merely a device to cover up your real business of transporting secret information to the enemies of this country. Very interesting, but just a figment of your imagination. I am a very busy man, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Where is Nancy Partridge? You're not looking for that girl. You're looking for a certain document. Oh, dear me, no. The document's perfectly safe. You see, uh, the man who has it doesn't know he has it. That's a very pretty tale, but quite untrue. The only man who had any contact with Grayson on the train was Senator Babcock. The senator doesn't have the document. We took the trouble to find out. Permit me. Thank you. Perhaps you've been misled by the common notion regarding the shape and bulk of state papers. They might easily have been reduced to a, to a convenient size, you know. Say, a document no larger than a, than a postage stamp. Postage stamp, huh? That's a very interesting theory, but not supported by the facts. I'm quite beside the point. Where's the girl? She's not here, of course, but you're quite at liberty to look round if you care to. Thank you. I shall do so. Interesting piece. Spanish, isn't it? Moorish. Oh, my error. It's an amazing specimen. I assure you, you won't find what you're looking for there. You stimulate my curiosity. This might be interesting. Incredibly inventive people, weren't they? Yes, it was in shocking condition when I got hold of it. But I had it restored. It's very lively now, but old fashioned. If that's the best you can do, Mr. Stanley, I think I may safely examine the rest of the room. Now help yourself. Thank you. Take your hand away from that drawer. Mr. Holmes, you didn't think I was going to draw a weapon. I never touched the things. How odd to find you squeamish. That connects only with the shop. You're very quick to say so. And yet a short while ago, I saw two other men in this room. 
and they didn't go back into the shop, so there must be another exit, and perhaps another room. Yes, Mr. Stanley, what is it? Bring Miss Partridge here at once. Excellent, Holmes. I see your voice hasn't lost its flexibility. And my hand hasn't lost its cunning either. When they come here, tell them to leave the girl with you and to clear out. You think I'll do that? Yes, you will. You're playing with lives now, Stanley. Not just the girls. Thousands. Millions, perhaps. And we don't intend to let one man have that much power. Not now, nor at any time in the future. I prefer you alive to face the retribution that's coming to you. But if I have to do it... All right, Mr. Holmes. I suppose we must all meet our mates sooner or later. Take your hands off him. Well, Mr. Holmes? Tell the clerk to go home and see the front door's locked. Well, Mr. Stanley? It's the last trick that counts, eh, Holmes? I'll remind you of that later. Allow me to present Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world-famous detective. He's come to rescue you. I don't believe you. Oddly enough, he's telling the truth. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and I did come here to help you. But I seem rather to have missed it. I'm sorry. I'm afraid you've had a bad time. Well, that doesn't matter. It's Peter. They say they'll do something to him if I don't tell them. They say they've got him. Cheer up. He's quite safe. A tough customer like Peter. Isn't disabled very long by a clout on the head. He's all right. All okay, Mr. Stanley. Look here, Stanley. This girl knows nothing. I promise she won't even identify you. Well, unfortunately, she knows enough to hang us. So do you. I'm surprised that you're walking into a trap like this. But you see the position I'm in and what has to be done. Katie, how? Give me great pleasure to attend to Mr. Holmes personally. Easter, and the girl's yours. It's the police! Oh, safe, Senator. Safe? No man is safe. Look at the way my constituents snipe at me. I don't recall seeing your face before, stranger. I don't think we've met. Well, that explains it. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Land and know you, Holmes. What's on your mind? Senator Babcock, 
I'm here to inform you of great peril to your life. Richard Stanley, a dangerous criminal, is now on his way here. Richard Stanley? Why, he's the most respectable citizen of Washington, has been for years. What could Stanley possibly want from me? A document. I'm under the stamps of a letter given to you by a chap named Grayson. Grayson? Grayson? Used to know a man. Eh? Grayson? Why, that's the fellow disappeared. Say, I've got that envelope right here in my wallet. Now, what does Stanley think could be under these stamps? A secret document of grave import, reduced to microfilm and concealed under these very stamps. Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. That's just what I wanted to know. I might have missed this microfilm if you hadn't led me to it. I seem to have underestimated your capabilities, Mr. Stanley. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Your famous powers of deduction and observation made it very well in Limehouse or Soho. But here in America, I believe you're out of your depth. If so, the verdict of history will be severe indeed. You're nervous, Sherlock Holmes? I must confess to a marked irritation. Do you, uh, mind if I smoke? Thank you. The whole course of the world might be changed by your acquisition of the microfilm. Oh, it will be, and for the better. You match. You can keep those. Thank you. And now, if you'll pardon me, Mr. Holmes. Why don't you do something, Holmes, if that thing's so all fired important? The English senator. Cricket, old boy, always cool in the crisis. The last trick, eh, Holmes? Yes, the last trick. Say, you're a smart fellow, Holmes. <laughs> Here's the microfilm, Holmes. Thank you, Senator. I say, Holmes! This is the microfilm with the document on it. It'll be in the proper hands within the hour. As I told you, Mr. Stanley, the man who had it didn't know he had it. Well, come on, let's go. Well, it'll be nice to get home to Baker Street, eh, Holmes? Yes. But this is a great country, Watson. It certainly is, my dear fellow. Look, up there ahead. The capital, the very heart of this democracy. Democracy? The only hope for the future, eh, Holmes? It's not given to us to peer into the mysteries of the future. But in the days to come, the British and American people will, for their own safety and for the good of all, walk together in majesty, in justice, and in peace. That's magnificent. I quite agree with you. Not with me. With Mr. Winston Churchill. I was quoting from the speech he made not so long ago in that very building. Thank you.